Good morning. Welcome to Trinity United Church. We are located in the west end of Edmonton, as you know, and we are in the territory, the traditional territory and the home of peoples of First Nations who signed Treaty 6. And across the region of Treaty 6, that includes Cree, Ojibwe, and Assiniboine people. This area is also part of the Métis Nation. We are also an affirming congregation, always striving toward inclusion and participation by all, appreciating the diversity of sexual orientation and gender identity. So welcome today to Trinity United Church. Welcome to those who join us online as well. By way of announcements, I would like to um, invite everyone, if you are able, to stay following worship today. We're having a sandwich lunch and we're having some conversation time, some intentional conversation, so we won't just be talking about the weather, although we might talk about the weather a little bit, um, but then we'll get into some other topics as well. But before we continue in worship, let's take a moment to greet those folks who are around us. Um, we won't get up and move around, but just turn and, and um, say hello, give a wave, give a nod to those folks around you. And a reminder that our service is recorded and it, so that it can be uploaded, uh, edited and uploaded to our YouTube channel each week so that you can re review it and share it with others as well. We hear that the risen Jesus came to the disciples saying, peace be with you. Because we are assured of the power of new life within us and within our world, we light our Christ light. New life is in us and is in the world. Let us pray. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it in all its fullness. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. O oh God, you came to the disciples and offered them an Easter assurance. You came to Thomas and offered him resurrection hope. Come to us in this time of worship, and fill us with faith, hope, and love. God, alive and among us this day, to you no door is closed, to you no heart is locked. Draw us beyond our doubts and fears until we see the risen Christ and say in our hearts, we believe. Amen. Let us join together singing. In Voices United at number 177, this joyful Easter tide. The words are also projected. <laughs>
I'm going to jump ahead a little bit in that I'm going to talk a little bit about a scripture reading, and we haven't heard the scripture reading yet. But in today's gospel reading, there's a line that could easily slip past us, but the impact of it really is enormous. Uh, John chapter 20, verse 19. So it's the very beginning of our gospel reading for today. And it goes, When it was evening on that day, and the doors of the house where the disciples met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them. Now, one commentator that I came across said, Now the doors of the house where the disciples, all of whom were Jews, had met were locked for fear of the Jews. You see the problem here? Also, in the Easter season, we may hear words from the book of uh, the Acts of the Apostles, particularly one offering in chapter 2. You that are Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, you crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law. There's a concern for us for various reasons. First of, it, first of all, we know that there has been a significant rise in anti-Semitism around the world, and we don't need to do anything more to feed that. Second, it distorts and harms Jewish people, people who are neighbors, people who are um, uh, people that we know in many cases. It harms Jewish people today as it builds on anti-Semitism from the church over 2,000 years. So what do we do about these scripture readings that are anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic? Amy Jill Levine is a professor of New Testament and Jewish studies, and she holds positions at several different universities. Uh, she sits on a couple of different endowed chairs at different universities, so she's very well known and very well respected in in these fields of study. And she's been writing and speaking about these problems for years. There are a host of YouTube videos. If you want to just search her name, you'll come up with a whole lot of them. And she's re she really comes across well. But I haven't got a video for you of her today. Instead, what I will do is uh, reply to or, or, or um, offer a couple of observations that she's made. She says there are six approaches that churches have used in dealing with these texts, realizing that there's problems with them, okay? It's not just we, we say them and forget about them, realizing that there are problems with these, uh, with these texts. One of them is, that, is, is excising or taking it out, taking out the problem verses. But unfortunately, that can make for a somewhat choppy or or incoherent narrative. She says there's six ways the churches deal with them and all of them have some problems. Another way we do it is we substitute the word Jews for, say, Judeans, or religious leaders, or Jewish leaders. One of the problems with that is it actually takes away the Jewish identity of Jesus, his disciples, his family, and some of those changes aren't entirely accurate as well. I know that she's a scholar, so she knows what she's uh, talking about when she says Jesus and his family were Galileans, not necessarily Judeans. So take that for what it is. Some say in, in some of these texts, for example, in the Passion narrative, in the story where Jesus is on trial, for example, and... Pilate goes to the crowd outside and says, we have this man, is he, you know, should we put him to death or not? And the crowd says, put him to death. Well, we know that that was, we, we assume that was a Jewish crowd, it was identified as such. So sometimes in churches we'll say, well, that represents all of us, that's the church, because sometimes we reject Jesus and that kind of thing, which is not a bad way of thinking about it. But the problem with it is when we think about the outcome of that whole story, we talk about forgiveness. And so the Christians are forgiven, but the Jews are still left there not forgiven. 
John's Gospel. We read John's Gospel a lot through the season of Easter, so we come across these many times. Sometimes we put John's Gospel in a historical context where there was a time when there was alienation between Jewish people and this new group that we've come to know as Christians. And there may be some truth to that in history, but the words are still there. The words that are so damaging are still there. Now, going on with some of that historical context, it gets even more extreme. And John is writing from a later time than some of the other Gospels, and so some of that animosity might have been a little bit more carefully defined by that time. But some of the extreme um, expressions of that animosity probably weren't accurate. Uh, it probably wasn't the case that Jews were expelling Christians from synagogues. And sometimes, kind of in the last way, people kind of, it's like you throw up your hands and you say, we know that this is a problem, but this church still loves our Jewish neighbors. And then you go on and read it just as it is. So it's some sort of like, we're not doing anything about it. So comes to the question, what do we do? What do we do? And just as there's no solution that doesn't have drawbacks, we realize that various approaches are helpful. So just talking about it, like I'm doing here, sometimes I'll mention it in a, in a sermon, recognizing that it's a problem as I'm preaching about it. Sometimes it's not appropriate within a sermon to get into that, but different things can be helpful. First of all, acknowledge that the passage is there and acknowledge that it's problematic. Sometimes we can explain things as we go along, realizing that it is necessary to explain these things. And I think perhaps above all else, we as faithful people need to come to Scripture with some humility, knowing that these Scriptures, these Scriptures which are so precious to us, which are a treasure and a joy and a source of beauty and hope, for us, have also been a source of pain and abuse through the life of the church over 2,000 years. And this has been true in, our, in the relationship of Christians with Jews, but it's also been true in terms of the, the, uh, um, the way women are portrayed or people of diverse sexuality or gender expression or for people with disabilities. So there's no simple answer to that. If we think there's simple answers, then we're fooling ourselves. But coming to it with a, with a sense of humility and regretful that this is how our scriptures, our precious treasure of scriptures, has also been used to hurt others. So that's what's coming. In our, in our reading today, that will be in our reading, and that's a whole lot of stuff that comes be, behind that. But we'll move on from that as we're, as we're uh, learning about this scripture. So before we get to that, though, we're going to sing. And I'll invite you to, to uh, if you follow in Voices United at number 166, or watch uh, of you the um, projected words, Joy Comes with the Dawn.
reading from the first epistle of Peter, chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have, you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that though perishable is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This ends the first reading. The second reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 20, 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors where the house, at the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his, his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who is called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here, and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is part of our sacred story. Thanks be to God. What comes to mind for you when we speak of church people? Who are church people? There are many ways that we could answer that. Many different expressions of what it means to be someone who goes to church, who lives according to the faith of the church. How do you live your life based on the doctrines, the beliefs, the creeds, or the practices of a church? It's not always a straightforward or easy question to answer. 
Some people take their church identity as a privilege to hold against others. They're certain that they are right and everyone else is wrong. We see this kind of expression in the rise of white Christian nationalism. That's become a a stronger and dangerous force we've seen through parts of the United States. I haven't heard or read how it is in this side of the border, but these kinds of things do migrate, and it's concerning. These are the ones who take their beliefs and the specifics of the morality that their beliefs generate and look to impose them on the whole of society. And it seems like they're determined to restrict and remove hard-won freedoms and rights from women, from people of color, from sexual minorities, and even from evidence-based decision-making in government. These are the kind of church people that give church people a bad name. And some church people are less political, but just as annoying. And you've probably come across these sorts. Maybe they have a scripture verse ready for any occasion. And it can be difficult to have a conversation because they're always trying to find God's will in this situation or see what God's design is in everything that happens. Maybe not so dangerous, but they can also give church people a bad name. There's another kind of church person that I think many of us would also recognize, and these are people who go to church and know that their faith translates into action in the community and in the world. And I know in this congregation, we have people who bring faith to bear on the availability of food for everyone, food justice, for example. We have people who want to do something to help people who struggle with poverty or being unhoused. We have people who support justice and peace and reconciliation and climate justice. We have people who make scarves and shawls and hats for, for others because, because they need them, because they want them to know that we're thinking about them. Being a church person, for many folks that we know, many of you folks, begins with worship and prayer and fellowship and reaches out to the wider community. This Sunday, after Easter Sunday, or the second Sunday in the season of Easter, is important for us as we think about what Easter means for us. You can kind of think about it as we are moving on from the celebrations of Easter Day, Easter Sunday, and moving out and living by the implications of the resurrection. So the scripture that we're directed to shows the disciples gathered together on that first day. And they were uncertain, and they were afraid. They expected that, as they heard about Jesus being raised from the dead, there would be rumors and there would be gossip spreading around the community, and it's certainly understandable that they would fear for their safety because they didn't know what this meant for them or for the world, and it would be no good for the peace of Rome to have a small group of radicals like them saying that their leader had risen from the dead. That would not be a good scene from that point of view. But Jesus walks into the middle of their fear. The resurrection, new life that we see in the risen Jesus is there in their midst, in their time of fear and wonder and questions. More than that, Jesus sends them out with peace and a blessing and a commission to offer forgiveness. 
He tells them that the Holy Spirit will be with them. In the midst of their fear and their amazement. Jesus tells them that they have everything that they need to carry on the work that needs to be done. In offering forgiveness, they are offering hope in the difficult and troubling world. They have everything they need. How do you feel about that? Do we feel that we have everything that we need? Are we able to show compassion in our complex world? That may be one way of saying in contemporary language that we can forgive sins. Because with compassion in this complex and troubled and difficult world in which we live, you see that there are many pressures and forces on us, all of us, that make us do what might not be best. And with a heart of compassion, we can see that actions are not always willfully evil. Compassion can see to the heart. And are we able to stand against injustice? That might be a way that, in our contemporary language, we can say that some sins are not forgiven. The hurt and the injury of human actions cannot be passed over. The consequences of actions need to be addressed. So Jesus gives his disciples his peace and the breath of the Holy Spirit. We have all that we need to live with a heart of compassion and a heart that seeks out justice. And finally, there's Thomas. Many pots of ink, spools of typewriter ribbon, pixels on a computer screen have been used to speak of Thomas. Doubting Thomas, as we often called him. So we hear some of the themes that come out of that, that faith can dispel doubt, that our doubts are the grist for wondering and deepening our faith, there's plenty to be said on the theme of doubt that we see in Thomas. It's actually voiced and, and, and given words. Thomas gives us a wonderful opening to those conversations. It's good when we can talk about feelings of doubt and uncertainty, for we all experience doubt. Certainty, or maybe we can say that, unexamined kind of certainty can actually be toxic. There was a movie, I think it was about 15 years ago now, by the name of Doubt, featured Meryl Streep, who was a religious sister who was the principal of a Catholic school, and Philip Seymour Hoffman was the priest who was assigned to the school. And this principal, played by Meryl Streep, was certain that the relationship between this priest and a particular student of the, of the school was both inappropriate and abusive. She was certain of it, and she hounded him and did everything that she could to see that he was removed. And the highlight of the film comes when she admits that she has doubts about her actions. Doubt is an important correction to that kind of certainty that can be toxic, that can become toxic. This is the kind of certainty that we see among those who we identify as white Christian nationalists in that movement. Now there's another aspect of Thomas that I think also needs our attention, and that has to do with the wounds. Thomas wanted to see the wounds that were in Jesus' hands and side. I'll say I've often interpreted that. I've heard others often interpret that as Thomas wanting that measure of certainty that comes with that old phrase like seeing is believing, wanted that kind of certainty 
Poor Thomas. He just wants to be like those annoying Christians who walk around with their heads in the clouds, certain of their own virtue. As I get older, I wonder about some of the things I thought I knew when I was younger. And so I wonder if there might be something else going on here with Thomas. When Thomas asks to see the wounds. What good is a risen Jesus if he doesn't bring his wounds with him? Through all of his ministry, Jesus touched the wounds of people in need. Throughout his ministry, there were acts of healing. There were times when he restored wounded lives to their families, their communities. In all of his ministry, he was with people and the wounds that they held. And then he was wounded himself. He knows the pains of life. He knows the hurts that we hold every day. If the risen Jesus did not bring his wounds with him, then his new life would not be new life. It would be something that would be impossible. So Thomas may be saying that he needs to know that Jesus' wounds came with him because he has always been with us in the wounds that we bear. The wounds that we bear. There are physical wounds. We know of physical wounds, whether injuries or disease or illness. There are wounds of grief and loss. There are wounds that are related to mental health or discrimination or poverty or exclusion. Jesus brings new life to us, wounds and all. And when Thomas learns that, he can then exclaim, My Lord and my God. This Sunday moves us from the celebrations of Easter, the wonder and the amazement, the joy and the surprise of the resurrection, all the hallelujahs that we sing, and we'll continue to sing, but it moves us on to the work of new life, creating a heart of compassion, standing and speaking for justice, calling for peace and living for peace. And this Sunday we see again that doubts can be an important check on that kind of unexamined certainty that can become toxic. And we also see that hearts and lives that are wounded, the world itself that is wounded, come under the promise of new life and hope to which we cling. So we continue in joy through this season of Easter. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our next hymn is found on 185 in Voices United. You tell me that the Lord is risen. It's a hymn that we may only sing once a year, but it's such a wonderful piece of writing. You tell me that the Lord is risen, that you have seen his face, then tell me why you crouch in fear and hide, in the, hide within this place. You say that he spoke words of peace and stood just as before, but till I touch his very flesh, I will not trust your joy. I love that line. I love that sentiment that expresses where Thomas was when he came to them that day. 185, you tell me that the Lord is risen.
we have received so much as God's beloved. In faith and in hope, in joy and in love, we bring our offerings now. Some offerings come now, and if you have offerings that you'd like to leave, there'll be a plate that's left at the entrance. And some offerings come in different means and by different, by, by different ways. But all of our offerings are a response to God's great love. So let us pray. O oh God, this is the offering of our time, our talent, and our treasure. May these gifts be used with wisdom and with justice in the church and throughout the world. Amen. In response, let us join together singing the short, the short song, This is the Day. We'll sing it over twice. This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Let us be joined together in prayer. Our loving God, the season of Easter calls on us to remember that your love and your compassion can bring us back to life when we feel lost and alone. The Easter season calls on us to trust that your hope can move us away from despair and hopelessness. We hear again the story of Thomas, and we are drawn to faithfulness to the ways of Jesus. We are drawn to the hope and the compassion and the love that which we know comes from Jesus and which calls forth our best hope and compassion and love. Help us to love in times of unknowing. Help us to be compassion, compassionate when Compassion is difficult. Our loving God, help your church to move and grow and respond in new and changing times. Help us to find strength in each other and in our neighbors of goodwill. Keep us fixed on your task of mending the world. Our loving God, there are many people who face troubles and challenges. There are many people who live with fears and uncertainties. We pray for our neighbors, both near and far. People with illness or injury. Communities coping with the effects of climate crisis. Communities living in poverty and neglect. Those who are unemployed or laid off or underemployed, families in discord and friends who are estranged, 
neighbors and friends and families whose struggles and troubles touch our hearts. Our loving God, you know the prayers of our hearts. You hear the cries of those in need and the unspoken prayers of all. Grant us courage beyond doubts and wisdom beyond fear. Help us to be loving as you have shown us through the ages and as we see in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. We close by saying the prayer of Jesus, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our hymn in Voices United at number 179, Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Give Thanks. Risen with Christ, may we know the assurance of God's presence. Risen with Christ, may we accept the challenge to work in God's way. Risen with Christ, may we be living proof that God's love will never die. Peace be with you, and let us sing this benediction to each other.
reminder to join us downstairs for lunch and our intentional conversations time. Goodbye to you all.